Tonight, my guest is Meros Maro, a missionary and the author of Consuming Passion, the story of her late husband, Joseph Maro. Mero shares about the life of Joseph, his passion and unconsuming passion for the Lord and for the lost, as well as the romantic life they had together. She then walks us through the pain of his sudden death on the mission field and the challenge of widowhood, as well as that of raising three sons as a single mother, and how she has managed to continue pursuing her call to reach the Muslims as a missionary all these 21 years tonight on James Talk Africa. Before we do that, please like this video and leave a comment below. Let's know what you think. And don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell button and share this video with somebody. From Cape Town to Cairo and from Mogadishu to Dakar, this is James Talk Africa. Hi there and welcome to this week's episode of your show. We decided to repeat this interview I had with our dear sister Meros because just a few weeks ago she went home to be with the Lord. It was such a shock for me out here in South Africa when I got the news that she had gone to be with the Lord. But as you listen to her, I want you to just here again her passion in this episode of course this is an interview i did with her two years ago uh, where she shared with me her the, the the journey of losing her husband on the mission field and she also shared in the end her heart that bonds to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and this lady has been a lady who has over the years in spite of her being a widow had continued to preach the gospel she has brought up her three uh, uh, young men who are now grown and she has continued to preach. I'm happy to tell you that she died at her post. She was at her last post which was in Togo in West Africa. She had once again in her older years she wasn't she wasn't reluctant to pack up her bags she packed all her bags up in 2019 and moved over to uh, uh, moved over to Togo sorry she packed up her bags in uh, 2021 sorry not 2019 and moved over to Togo and started a new work there it's in the midst of this new work that the Lord called her home I want to die in that way. I want to be able to die at my post. I want to be able to go to Jesus <laughs> still serving him. I don't want to retire and just find a beach somewhere. I want to be able to keep serving him until the day he calls me home. Meros is a challenge to all of us. Let's go to that interview now. Welcome, dear viewer, to this segment of your show. Like I said in the intro, my guest today is a dear friend of mine. Meros Maro is a missionary with Calvary Ministries Capro. She's served with Capro for how long now, Meros? For about 33 years. 33 years. You should have a medal, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, Meros is here. Thank you so much, Meros, for coming. Uh, Meros, you're here because of your book. You, Meros is a widow and has written a book about the life of her husband, Joseph Maro. And uh, you and Joseph Mar were married up till 21 years ago when he died. And this book first came out 21, 20 years ago, actually. Yes. But you, re you, you, you republished it last year, and that's why we want to talk about it. Consuming passion. Now, let, let's start, first of all, with you. How did you meet Joseph? What was your, how did you get into missions and how did you meet Joseph? Well, I got to know about missions when I was in the university. Capro came to my uh, school, uh, University of Joss, to do mission awareness program. That's how I got to know about missions. But prior to this time, I had had the call of God upon my life. And I didn't know the direction it was to go until I met Capro in 1983. So that's when I got to know that it was going to be missions. So I did my youth service with Capro. And you service the one year compulsory yeah, thing yeah, that yeah. Nigerians do after university uh, education. Go ahead. Okay, so I did my youth service with Capro with the intention to go back and do a secular job before coming back. But during that period of my youth service, God convinced me to continue with Capro as a missionary. So, 
So that's how I, I, I became a missionary in 1987 with Capro and served in various places in Nigeria before going over to Niger. But just before I, I left for Niger, I was working in a school of mission as a trainer. So I was, when, uh, I was among those I interviewed my would-be husband, Joseph Murray, when he came to become a student. So during the interview, I was so impressed with his life, with his testimony. And after the interview, God convinced me he was to be my husband. But that was before you left for Nigeria. That was just before I left for Nigeria Republic. But, okay. I, but of course, I didn't know anything that was in his mind. So I left for Nigeria Republic uh, as a missionary. That was January 1990. So uh, by May 19, that 19, that, the same 1990, I came back to Nigeria to attend my twin sister's wedding. I'm a twin. As I oh, yeah, we didn't mention that you're a twin. Like yeah. She looks very much like you. And you guys have this. You are Mary Rose and she's Rose <laughs> Mary. Mary. Yes. Go on. Okay, so when I came for my two sisters' uh, wedding, we met. Joseph and I met. I had the body to come to go to Algeria as a missionary. But the ministry asked him to go through Niger Republic. So he just wanted to have some information from me. So I gave him some information about Niger. So when I went back to Niger, we started communicating by letter writing. Then the next year, I came back to Nigeria for an uh, end-of-year program, last year's gathering. So we met again. It was then he proposed to me, and that's how we met. And we got married in 1991. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you describe in the book how beautiful your life as a wife, married to Joseph, was you. You make, you, it, it looked like something like out of a, a love story book. Tell us about, just a bit about that life with Joseph as a wife. Actually, uh, it started with uh, when God convinced me about him as my husband because he had all the quality I'd, I had always longed for, I had always dreamed about in a man, physically, spiritually, and the rest. Uh, I'm very romantic in nature, so when we got married, I discovered that he was, not, he was too spiritual, so to say, about <laughs> those kind of issues, but I convinced him that we were still on earth. He needed to to be ugly. <laughs> so what I admire about him was the fact that he was willing to adjust because of me. You know, I told him the kind of things I wanted from him as a husband. Uh, he must buy love cards, romantic cards for me. He must take me out for dinner. Uh, and he must never forget my birthday. If he does, ever does that, that would be, that would be very serious. <laughs> Offense. <laughs> Offense. So he adjusted. He made sure that my birthday was always very special. He would either take me out or he makes sure that he does the cooking throughout that day wow. or we go out as a family for picnic. Then he also makes sure that he gives me romantic cards from time to time and all those kinds of things. So I really appreciated that about, about his life. And then the children, when the children started coming, he showed a lot of love for them. I remember when he died, my first son was just five years old. So okay. I was asking, what do, you, what do you remember about your dad? He said he used to heal the sick, he used to buy things for us, he cared so much for us. Mm. And he was asking me, is it, is, it a, is it a sin to love my dad more than I love Jesus? I said, no, you can't love anybody more than you love Jesus. So that showed the impact he also had. On the small boy. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the small boy at that time. Let's talk about how Joseph died. I remember it was 98, right? I was passing through Lagos, and I remember when the call came. First he was ill, then suddenly he died. Walk us through it. How, was, how did this happen? And, and tell us how you felt about it. Actually, it happened while we were still working as missionaries in the Niger Republic. It started by him not being able to sleep well in the night, was having sleepless problems. So we went to see the doctor, then they discovered he had some heart issue and he was treated. We came back, but he was still having a sleepless problem. So just for him, it was because of the stress of the work he was doing, because he was doing so much as a missionary in the Niger Republic. So we decided to go over to a friend's place to rest for some time, for him to be relieved of the stress. But the sleepless problem still persisted. It was very bad. He couldn't sleep in the, in the night, in the afternoon, any other time of the day, even though he was on some medications. So eventually our leaders asked us to come over to Nigeria so he could see a doctor properly. So we came over to Ibadan, to UCH Ibadan. Which is the southwest of Nigeria. Yeah, okay. to see a doctor. So they started treating him, both for the heart issue and other issues. Then I, I didn't notice that he was losing a lot of weight. Mm. At, at the point, he was so weak. He couldn't stand up by himself to do anything. So we felt, I called my leaders. I uh, remember that time, I called Brother Kbade Tokun, who was in Ibadan. Brother Imos, when Brother Imos house, but he was not around, he had traveled. These are leaders in Capra. Yes, I called Brother Kbade, I called Brother Ni Ibade. Brother Ni Ibade came. So we took him over to the hospital that evening. So when they were examining him, they came out to ask me if he had any case of diabetes. And he said, I said, no. But um, uh, I never knew anything about that. Prior to this time, I discovered that he was relating very frequently. Mm. So they did some things to discover that he had diabetes. Okay. So they now started treating him that, that, even, that evening on diabetes. And 
So I had, I remember I had a friend of Capro, Dr. Ghana, who's now a missionary, but mm -hmm. he was still a doctor at that time in the band, and he was the money doctors that were treating him. So at the point, I was in the room where they were treating him, at the point they drove me out of the room, because he's, and then um, I went out, I was still praying, I just, I had so much faith and trust that nothing would happen. Did you suspect something once they started driving you out of the room? Did I, really suspect? I was so confident that God would not allow anything to happen to, happen to him. To him okay. So we had sent a prayer point to friends mm -hmm. all over that he was sick. So people were praying. So I was so confident nothing would happen to him. So as I was outside that, that night, um, I remember Dr. Ghana came out. The way he was coming, he was coming with a lot of confidence. I thought he was coming to give me good news. Mm -hmm. Only for him to come and tell me that he's sorry my husband had passed away. Did you believe it? I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. Because how, how did you, what, tell, you just go ahead and say, how did you feel? <laughs> well, I just felt, no, this cannot happen. No, no, no. This, this was a man that had so much faith in God. I never believed in being sick. No, this cannot happen. I, I was not believing it. Until Brony, but they also came out and confirmed it. That's when I finally believed it. And when, that, when, it, when I believed, I just thought my world was, had collapsed. Because he was my everything. everything. Yes, I just <laughs> thank you. I just felt. <laughs> I, I show you living it once again. It's 21 years, but it's still yeah, yes, it's, it's still very so fresh. fresh. Very fresh. I just felt uh, there was no meaning for me in life yeah. again and uh, all those kinds of things. So it was a very difficult situation yeah, for me because yeah. you know we had a very close relationship. Uh -huh. And uh, he was very strong, mm. and he was always there, he was the one that does almost everything. Mm. He kind of pampered me, which I'm mm. very angry about right now. Because I felt he pampered me, and now he's no longer yeah, there. How to how struggle. You going to survive? Yes, I, will, I wasn't going to struggle. By the time he died, our children were very young. My first child was five years old. Mm. My second was three. My mm. last was just one year so old. So it looked impossible. So it looked impossible that I would be able to cope with taking care of the children. Mm. They're all boys. Mm. And I'm very delicate. Yeah. So I felt, how will I cope with taking care of these boys? So it was like a death sentence on like you. Death sentence on on you yes, yes. So for over a year, I was kind of depressed. Mm. I thought I would never be happy again. Mm. But after some time, I started gathering courage. Initially, I was not able to pray. I was not able mm. to read my Bible. Mm. For quite you must have felt angry at God. Of course, course, I was very angry at God. I felt, one reason I was very angry with God was that I felt this was a man that was ready to serve him with the whole of his heart. A give missionary. Every, give everything. Give up. everything for you. Missionary to the core. And you are looking for missionary. This was somebody who was ready to serve you. Mm. Then why did you take him away? Mm. And the work is still so much mm. that needs to be done. So one of the reasons I was very angry with God. Mm. And another second reason was because of our close relationship. Mm. Will I ever find anybody like him like again? God stealing away something so yeah, precious. He gave me something so precious and he just taking took it, it away. away. So that was one of the reasons, one of the reasons I was very angry with God. You know what and we're going to do, Meros? We're going to take a short break. Get our bread back. <laughs> and then when we come back, we're going to find out how you resolved your things with God and okay. the wonderful things that happened. But we'll explore more about Joseph and all that. Uh, there, viewers, uh, I smile because I'm part of the story. I know a bit of it, but it's, it's to say we'll take a short break. We'll be talking about the book, Consuming Passion. Um, I'll read out what is up here. I can do all other aspects of the work. If then I must fulfill my call, I have no option but to go to the foreign field. That was Joseph there. We'll take a short break, and when we come back, we'll continue with this uh, very touching story of uh, Meru's life with Joseph Maro and then the life afterwards. Please don't go away. God use the stumbling blocks that you think are stumbling blocks as stepping stone to greatness for you. Where is your faith? No, 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 no. Where is your faith? No, no, no. Problem with Dr. Kennedy. The way the church in Africa is now, what we need is revival. We cannot correct a wrong mm. with another wrong. Mm. We cannot correct the injustice of the past by perpetuating. You have what it takes to make a difference. So don't give up on yourself because God has certainly not given up on you. Welcome back, Davies, to the second part of my interview with Meros Maro. Meros is a missionary with Capro Ministries, Capro, an indigenous African missionary agency with over 400 missionaries in 37 countries scattered around Africa, particularly among Muslims and in the Arab world too. Meros herself served for many years with her husband as a missionary to Niger Republic, which is a majority Muslim country. Meros, before we left touch, you were taking us through 
just the disappointment you felt with God uh, following Joseph's death, and this is 21 years ago, and we could still feel how, how, how much emotional the whole thing is for you. And uh, you talked about the points of the fact that God disappointed you, the sense that this is a man who gave everything, and this is a man who he has given to you. And over the years, I've seen you glow. Mm -hmm. I've seen you grow. I've seen you walk away from that depression into, that you said you had for the first year into joy. You are known now with, as a woman of passion. <laughs> and that's, uh, you know. So, so where, how did God bring you to this place? Uh, what, where, where, how did God comfort you? Because it must have been extremely difficult. Well, God used various things. Uh, he spoke to me directly from his word of his love for me. So I came to realize that the fact that my, my husband died so prematurely was not because God hated me. He had a reason for it, which I don't know till now. But uh, I, I was so secure in God's unconditional love for me. So I, I could feel the love of God. I don't know how it came about. But I could just feel that God was there for me. He loved me. Uh, what was it like bringing up those three boys okay. uh, over this last 20 years? Well, initially I was very worried how I was going to bring them up, particularly that they were boys, and I, know, I was so scared about their teenage years, if I would be able to cope with all the troubles I was expecting from them. But God surprised me. My children have been very well behaved. They've not really given me much stress. I'm not saying they are perfect children, but they've been well behaved wherever they are. They have good testimonies, and people used to come to ask me, how did, how did I bring up these children? And someone had even asked me to write a book on bringing up children, because they always... Have a, they live exemplary like wherever they find themselves. So I really want to thank God. And they're for, following the Lord. That's they're the most following the Lord and it. serving the Lord. With passion too. <laughs> well, not as much passion as I should have wanted, but, <laughs> <laughs> but they, are, they are on the way to it. Then secondly, the way God, God surprised them by the way he provided for our finances to take care of them. I never really had problem. All of them went to uh, very good schools. Let me give you an example of what happened. When my first son finished from secondary school, I desired that he should go to a, a private university. I didn't want mm -hmm. to go to a public university. Mm -hmm. So I was praying and asking God to provide the finances. So God provided for us, wow. so beautiful. Wow. I'm not saying that we never had times of lack, mm -hmm. but all that we needed, God made it available for us. So wow, wow. Especially the way the boys have turned out. Yeah. Uh, they, they, there's always this... Uh, testimony of they received this, they've won that prize, they're the head of one Christian group, and all that. And mm -hmm. what did you do? Where's, you must tell us what's going to be in that book of child, <laughs> child parenting. Are you a single parent? Yeah. What did you do? What is the, well, I think, what uh, is the secret? Well, I mentioned some of them in this, my book, Consuming Passion. Mm. Because I knew the people so always... Those who get to will also uh, get that part uh, of it. Yes, okay. yes, people always wanted to know what's the secret. Mm. Well, I can't really... Well, I would say the first of all is God's grace. Yeah, well, another thing I did was that I showed them unconditional love. Mm -hmm. I showed them I was there for them. That's my busy schedule as a missionary. I yeah, was, people must know you continued mm -hmm. as yeah. a missionary even after this yeah, Yes, as, as a single mother. It was not very easy combining both single motherhood and missionary work. But God helped me that I showed them unconditional love. No, even when I see their weaknesses, I don't emphasize too much on that. I emphasize more on their strong points. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I did. And then prayer. Every single day I pray for my children. Whatever I'm praying about, I will make sure that I pray for them that they will live godly life and mm -hmm. bring glory to God. They will have the fear of God upon mm -hmm. their life and then God will kill them. So I pray that prayer every single day. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some of the things you wrote here about Joseph. Uh, uh, the, some of the characteristics you brought out about him. Number one of this is you talked about a life of integrity. Tell us a bit about that. Well, he was a man that was a man of integrity that emphasized so much living a righteous and holy life before God that was ready not to compromise his faith for anything's sake. I remember before he became a missionary, he was a lecturer at Brandon KB University. Mm -hmm lecture in the Department of Engineering. So there was a time they wanted to, some government officials came to the school to look at the facilities of the school so that they could upgrade the school. So his uh, head of department asked him to tell lies that the engineering department has some things that they didn't have. Mm -hmm. When they asked him, he said he was not going to tell any mm -hmm. lies. He, at the risk of losing his job, he refused to tell lies. Wow. And then another incident happened when we were in Niger Republic. There was some, an American couple that used to support us as a family. Mm -hmm. So there was a time they had a friend in Nigeria who was to go come to Nigeria. We were to come to Nigeria with our car. Mm. So they asked us if we could go with her. We agreed. But when my husband discovered that she did not have an international passport, mm. 
he said he was not going to pick her because he did not want to find himself in a position where he was going to tell lies at the mm. border or give bribe. So he told the couple he was not going to go with her. And I was scared. I said, these are the couple that are supporting us financially. <laughs> You're are losing your go, support. Are we not going to lose that support? But he insisted I was not going to carry her because he did not want to tell lies. Mm. And, then, and then throughout the period we were courting, he made sure that he didn't even hold my hands. He mm. was, didn't want to be tempted in any way. Mm. So he was that kind of man wow. that was uh, so... Wow committed to pleasing God mm. at all costs. You talked about his commitment, his passion for souls, uh, that aspect in the book about passion for evangelism and missions. Tell us a bit about it. Okay, for example, even before he became a missionary, he was working in a... Um, he did his service in Brandon Kevin, the north country part of Nigeria, and got a job afterwards. So at that time, it was forbidden to preach the gospel in buses or public places. So that one time, he was arrested for preaching the gospel in the bus. But he felt he, was, he would rather obey God rather than man. So that way he was so passionate about winning souls. Mm -hmm. Winning souls for Christ. I remember one of the sisters that made a comment about him when he died was that when they were in the university, he was always saying, what, why are you wasting time? What are you doing when souls are perishing? Mm -hmm. It was like he must do everything to bring souls into God's kingdom. Before he came to Capro, because he had a burning ambition to go to Algeria as a missionary. Mm -hmm. T tell me about, you know, you talk about passion, and I know your passion. It lies with Muslims. Yes. It lies with taking the gospel to them. Till today, that's what you do. Uh, tell us about your prayer for Muslims, your desire. As we round up, <laughs> and as listeners, uh, our viewers are there, uh, could you encourage them to love Muslims? Well, I'm very passionate about Muslims because I see them as a group of people that have been so deceived by the devil. No, uh, no, when the Bible talks about uh, the God of Israel blinding their eyes, it's exactly the case of Muslims. The spirit behind Islam have truly blinded their eyes. They are so deceived to think they are on the right path. So it grieves my heart so much to see people that are so passionate to want to please God, but they are doing it wrongly because they don't believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I'm so passionate about praying for them, first of all, because I believe that it is through prayer that their eyes can be open to know who Jesus is, that he's not just a prophet, mm. he's the savior that came to save us from our sins. And I, I believe in mobilizing the church to pray for mm. them. I, I truly wish that the church can spend more time praying for their deliverance, mm. because they're a group of people that have been blinded and held over by the powers of darkness. Mm. So my passion is to pray and see a release of many Muslims come to God's kingdom in the 1040 mm. window where they are the majority. Mm. I really pray for missionaries who are laboring among them, that they see fruits and results, because mm. one other thing that grieves my heart is that many missionaries spend so many years walking among them and they see so little mm. results. And the problem is that the church is not praying, praying enough. enough. Because the Bible said that you cannot enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions. So you first tie the strong man. Mm. So we need to tie the strong man behind Islam mm. through our prayers. Mm. So that's why I so, I so much believe in prayers. I'm so passionate about reaching them, um, seeing them come to God's kingdom, seeing them, be, particularly the women among them. What would be your last word to those who are watching? Of course, I'd love you to get this book. How do people get this book? Uh, they can get it at Capro office, uh, number 9 and 10, 13 streets. And they you can know, give we'll, me a call. We'll be putting something on the screen for you. There will be other things on the screen for you to know where you will get this book. This is a book uh, I read through and uh, I had the privilege of seeing it even before it was printed. It's something you can't, it's a small book that you can easily go through quickly, but it would definitely... Just 500 naira. Yeah, it was, and it's just, it's 10, 20 rands or 500 naira or one... It's about two or three dollars, and you'll be able to feed your soul with it. Meros and then the, the, post, the eighty percent of the proceeds want you to go towards the work of evangelism in Algeria, yeah. northern North African countries, where, where Joseph wanted, wanted to, to go to. to. Yeah. So you see, you're buying the book, and it's going towards furthering the work that this man had in his heart to do. Meros, a last word to us as we round up. It's my fear and concern for the church. I see the church as becoming so lukewarm, and uh, they have deviated from the path. The Lord Jesus Christ wanted us to follow it. The Bible said that Jesus Christ coming to rapture a church without spots or wrinkles. So I really deserve praying for revival to take place in the church so that we can be prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus. Another area I'm also so bothered and praying for is the church to be actively involved in winning souls. Mm. Because Jesus Christ gave us that commandment. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creation. It grieves my heart to think of anybody going to hell. So it, and God has given us the key, the tool, and his, we are his instruments, we are his mouthpiece to, to preach the gospel to people. So every believer should take evangelism as a lifestyle, and we should also be involved in the work of mission. It will bother us that there are still so many unreachable groups in the world today who have not had the opportunity of hearing the gospel message. We all, we all have a role to play in the work of missions. So I cannot be praying intensively for missions 
you are giving your financial support or you are going out as a missionary. The commandment to go out to do mission was not just to capture a load for the whole church. So we all have a role to play. Because and the Bible said that except the gospel is preached as a witness to all nations, Jesus Christ will not come. So if we want to see Jesus Christ coming back, we have to be involved in the work of evangelism and mission and living rightly so that our lifestyle will speak first, even before our words. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meroza. Uh, that was a good way to cap it up. I'll come back and wrap up later on, but thank you so much, Meroza. Meroza is the author of the book, Consuming Passion, the biography of Joseph Maro, who was her husband. And thank you so much for how you shared with us your heart. This is where we'll draw the curtain. God bless you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi there, and welcome back. I, I do trust uh, just listening to Meryl's share there, especially towards the end when she shares of her heart for the unreached and calls you to respond. I, she didn't know when she was saying that that she had just a few more months or, or just two more years to live on this earth. But she lived well and she died well. And uh, I, I want to challenge you. Maybe you're sitting there, you've been dragging your feet on the call to go to the unreached, the call, the missionary call upon your life. Uh, I want to encourage you not to waste your life. Success is not succeeding in things and being applauded by men. It's, it's being faithful and doing what God put you on earth to do. We can succeed in quote, in a thing outside the will of God. Make sure you're in the will of God. Make sure you're doing what God asked you to do. And if God's called you to go to the unreach, to, to be a missionary like Meros was, I want you to consider contacting us with the information on the screen and uh, let's see how we can help you. Thank you so much for joining us this week. I pray that the testimony of Meros and her life will challenge all of us to live a life that counts for eternity. I'll see you same station, same time next week. Bye for now. Please like this video and leave a comment below. Let's know what you think. And don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell button and share this video with somebody else.